much for being here. Really appreciate that you're here. Trisha's Orchid Life had a request video with regards to my thought process on how I fertilize my mounts. I have two varieties of mounts simply because there are some orchids that I don't want to as yet transition onto my inorganic mounts. So I have a dendrobium community mount here with several different dendrobiums, but with the same root size, very important. Everything I talk about today is about root size. I have my Brassavola flagellaris over there, a Dendrobium anosmum, and then tucked up in the corner is my Victoria regina on an organic mount. I have a little exception here. Let's talk about, as we're heading into winter, how I water my mounts that are not in my preferred setup. You can see I have two different varieties of mounts in the background, but yeah, I have some orchids that have recently arrived and they are not ready to be put into any kind of a setup and they're still going to be watered like this in the winter. They are on cork and when they are on some kind of a plaque cork mount, even if it's clay, all these materials absorb water very, very quickly and retain it also for a considerable amount of time. So my winter for mounts, the classic, classic mounts, this is what I do. I make a little dish with a little bit of fertilized water in it, whatever the nutrient is that goes in, fertilizer, supplement, or seaweed, or extract, anything like that. But this is how I water them. I let them just bop around in that water, let the material soak up the water, and then nourish the roots. I am not risking anything getting into that crown. Different with what you are going to see now, because I do a lot of spraying, and that is impossible for some of the candidates I have right now. That is why they get that little dish. So let's get on with the PPM. Basically the root size for me is the determining factor of how many PPM I will put on these mounts. So very, very fine roots, same as with my pots, 160 parts per million. That is all, but because it is on a mount, it needs it more often and then the ratio doubles and because in my climate, the roots will dry out super quick. And if I am not careful, the salt buildup will be exponential because the evaporation is faster than any absorption of nutrients for the roots. So you can see where I'm already headed here. If you have the opportunity to provide a high humidity controlled environment for your mounts, that is great. That changes the game entirely. You won't have to water as much as I do here in my climate. A greenhouse is perfect, for example. You can get humidifiers going or even occasional mistings going on on a timer. And you always get that humid environment that an epiphyte just loves because apart from absorbing water by rain, epiphytes will also absorb moisture from the atmosphere. And that is why their aerial roots are where they are. They search out the moisture in the atmosphere. You can also see by growth habit where your high humidity is in your room or greenhouse because that is where the roots will tend to lean and grow towards. My aphyllum here, you can maybe you can see right here how my roots are going left. That is because where it lives, this is the cooler side of the whole wall where it lives. And there's another mount next to it that is also getting misted. So the growth tendency of the roots will also show you where your humidity pockets are in your growth space. Again, if that is a greenhouse, they can be all over the place because humidity is ideal all over the place inside the greenhouse. If you're growing at home and you have a humidifier, maybe you've noticed your roots going in one direction and it's possible they will always have a tendency to go to where that humidity is in the air. The thing is with root size, it doesn't matter on a mount whether a root is large or small, how much fertilizer you give it. What is important is that the roots do not burn, that there is no rapid evaporation so that they have the ability to absorb the nutrients. And to know the root characteristics as well is important so that the PPM, if it's too much, doesn't burn out the velamen on a root that is, for example, not going to absorb any water anyway, because it's far too new, as is the case with my Brassavola flageralis over here. I always find it fascinating that these new roots, they repel water. This is what I call the Teflon effect. 
there is no absorption at all. They look much chunkier when they are growing than when they start absorbing water. They get a little bit skinnier. And this is not to be confused with a medium sized root. It is still in my eyes, a small size root because they have the ability to burn very, very quickly. If these water droplets right here, I hope I'm pointing and you can see that in the viewfinder, but if these water droplets right here were to evaporate before the minerals had time to absorb, which of course in this example they wouldn't, then these deposits on the velamen would cause burn. My orchid is getting larger and larger. Her requirements are getting higher and higher as well. She needs more fertilizer, but I'm still gonna stick with 160 parts per million. And if I have to, I will do that over several hours during the day so that I am giving her what she needs, doubling or tripling the PPM in smaller doses, but I am not risking the roots getting burnt because they're not even ready to absorb that. So the characteristic of a root is extremely important to understand as well. Is it capable of absorbing or is it still repelling water and you don't want the burn? Now, in my example, I'm feeling quite safe at the moment because I only have plain RO water. They've had their drink for the morning and I'm on the west side. Imagine the sun pounding. If you have them in a bright location, a little bit windy and the sun is pounding on them, the evaporation is so much faster. Your minerals will sit on the roots and then cause them to shrivel, die, as we call it, burn. My PPM is very, very conservative, but there is a lot more going on. If you have mounts that you only water once a day because you've got moss on them, then that's fine. You can still stay with lower parts per million, but you're doing it every day. Then you're just watering one day a week or twice a week with plain water. The metabolism of orchids is so slow, especially on mounts. There is no need to go in full throttle and think job done and walk away. They are so slow in absorbing nutrients that going overboard is so much more riskier than erring on the side of caution and going with 160 parts per million, even as the orchid grows in size. We can make adaptions and changes to our mounts. In my case, I add more material. My hop filter acts as sphagnum moss to accommodate the fact that the roots need to be able to absorb the water that we provide over an extended period of time as the orchid grows. But when they're itty bitty like my anosmum right here, same root size as my brassavola there, same root size. When you see this kind of dynamic happening here, this orchid always looks beautiful on mounts and I could put it on an organic mount, get on with it, I'm sure it would be happy. Now that is not my choice of growing, but I have noticed in the past two years, I'm not getting any performance out of this orchid and it needs a lot more fertilizer. So my 160 parts per million, I have noticed over the past two years has not done me any favors at all. Sorry, just checking the heat of the leaves has not done me any favors at all because I have the same length cane as before. And these canes should be five times the length at a minimum for an anosmum to be healthy. In this case, no matter how much parts per million I throw at this orchid, I have to come to the realization, this is not the setup in my climate for this orchid. And next year she is going in a pot. Much like my Dendrobium tortile back in the day, it was getting massive and big and to accommodate it on a mount would have been counterproductive because I wasn't able to provide the right amount of fertilizer it needed for its growth potential without destroying the roots. So there's another factor to take into consideration is the performance of the orchid stunted because it is not getting enough of what it needs because we have it on a mount. If you up the fertilizer, just because for example, roots are growing and now we can get a move on and get the orchid to grow, that is the wrong time to be even be upping fertilizer on brand new roots. The orchid needs to work with the old roots that it has from the previous year prior to then activating and being able to use the roots it is growing now on this year's new growth. So it has to be very, very carefully judged. And if I can recommend anything, anything at all, 160 parts per million, you won't go wrong. The only thing that I would say is if your orchid is getting bigger and bigger, the question is, can you keep up with its needs while it is on a mount? 
Or do you have to add more sphagnum moss so that the water retention remains over a longer period of time for the orchid to absorb the nutrients and the water for it to grow to its potential and then know that the acidity of your sphagnum moss is going to break down because you're keeping the mount wetter for longer, meaning the sphagnum moss needs to be replaced. And in my case, again, erring on the side of caution, I always did it every six months, whether the orchid was an active growth or not, carefully picking out the old and replacing with the new. At one point, one of those moss exchanges was always with new roots, but the one in between, there was no active root growth. But to change the moss, it is paramount, especially if an orchid is coming to size and you are watering it more heavily just to make sure that the growth of the orchid is not stunted. So here's the other thing. When it comes to fresh moss, like up here on my Dendrobium Victoria Regina, this moss, I didn't put this moss there. It's just a cork slab, regular commercial slab, not as good quality as with my film right here. So this one is going to be breaking down, I think, pretty quick because I have to keep this orchid watered a lot during my hot summers. It's an intermediate to cool grower, definitely nothing to do with heat, but it's surviving because, thankfully, there is live moss up there keeping the roots cool. So this moss has a different pH characteristic as well as plain, let's say, the dead sphagnum moss that we use for our orchids, our mounts, and our pots. It is not as acidic. It will take the same pH that I apply for all the other mounts from 6.3 to 6.5, but usually I'm around 6.3. And although it is media that is organic, it is alive. And you can see I have not burnt my moss. If my pH was far too acidic for it, then I would get all the brown bits and the moss would have died by now. So one has to really pay attention to the state of the media, the state of the cork or whatever organic media that is used as a mount, the state and the quality and the lifespan of sphagnum moss to protect the roots from also failing if the moss gets too acidic and plus we are pHing a little bit lower because we want to put a swing of nutrients absorption into our orchids. In my head, I am making complete sense. That's my head. I'd like to know if this makes sense as you are listening. Let me know in the comments below. And if I can recommend anything at all with regards to mounts, no matter the size of the orchid, there's one thing to be said. Keep the parts per million as conservative as possible. If need be, water every day the same amount of parts per million and then just water or flush the organic mount through with plain water so that the salts don't build up exponentially. When it comes to fleshy, fleshy roots on a mount, let's say Phalaenopsis, I don't have one mounted, the same principle applies. In my books, I would not go up to 300 parts per million with one single watering. The mount will dry out faster than the roots can actually take up those minerals. Even if there's a good amount of sphagnum moss around to keep the roots a little bit more wet. The same principle all the way through on all kinds of mounts. 160 parts per million on a regular basis, flushing the mounts through regardless of the size of the roots, the orchid will do absolutely fine if it is able to take up the nutrients with enough time to spare. And clearly, this method here with my Dendrobium anosmum, that is not the case. Doesn't mean that the orchid can't do it, it means the setup is wrong. This is something to be discovered through the journey and course of having an orchid in your possession. How is it developing? Is it getting better? In the case of my Brassavola right here, this thing is going mad because it is happy with the climate I've provided around this mount. This might not work for every single orchid. It might need a different configuration for another orchid. But clearly, here, even with hob material, my anosmum will not be happy, will never grow to full potential in my climate and under the circumstances that I grow. This could probably work in a greenhouse. It could also work if I had a humidifier around but not under the circumstances that I'm growing. It's also important to take that into consideration when putting an orchid on the mount. These are epiphytes. They want a lot of humidity, but they don't have a lot of fertilizer around their roots, even in nature, probably even less than we provide in our homes. 
your opinion is going to be super, super important in the comments below. Like I said, this all made sense in my head, but that is because I do it on the daily and I've done so for so many years. Putting it into words is a completely different ballgame. So Trisha's Orchid Life, thank you for your request. I hope you didn't regret asking. <laughs> Let me know. I am open to any kind of conversation when it comes to these kinds of topics. I embrace them. And if I wasn't clear, then maybe if I write it down and clarify things further in the comments below, then I can probably get it right. I hope. Either way, thank you for your request. Trisha's Orchid Life, really appreciate it. Look forward to hearing from you and look forward to hearing from anybody else that has watched this video. I would really be interested if we can expand on this subject and get as many experiences in the comments below so that anybody else watching this, there's a lot, a lot of feedback. Love it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.